I'm going to talk about the strategy for Korea's economic success, but my main purpose is not to introduce Korea. Who cares Korea? But I'd like to show different perspectives. This is to say existing studies, existing approaches are not satisfactory to understand uh, the success of Korea, and you may not get a good lessons from the other studies. So we'd like to have a good lessons, the fundamental success factors for developing countries like Korea. So that's number one. The number one is I'd like to show a different perspective. And number two is, again, who cares Korea? This is the United States. So what is the implications for it? Why do I have to sit in here? So the second purpose of my presentation is to give some implications for, for American people like you. So my presentation is composed of two parts. Number one is different perspective to the success factors of Korea. And number two is implications for Californians, implications for Silicon Valley. Okay. So Korea's economic achievement. Uh, why Korea? You know, you have heard a lot about the success story of Korea. But the success story of Korea is, is a lot more significant than you may think. If you look at this graph, 1961, about half a century ago, 55 years ago, Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world, one of the bottom five. And now Korea is one of the most successful countries in the world. There's only one country, which is Korea, which is moving from the poorest country to underdeveloped to developed country. Only one in the history of human being. All the other Americans and Europeans used to be developed or potential for developed country. Japan was good. Hong Kong and Singapore are like a small state, like a city state. It's another good example. Only one country which has been transformed from low level or lowest level to pretty good level is this is this is the only one example. So that's why we need to study more about Korea. Not because this is the country that I'm from, but this is a good like a laboratory for for the students and scholars of business and economics. Again, 1961, about 50 years ago, Korea's per capita GDP was less than 100 bucks. One of the bottom five among the 200 countries in the world. Even lower than Kenya, 95. Malaysia, 287. Saudi Arabia did not report at the time. But you know, 10 years later, Saudi Arabia uh, per capita GDP was about $1,000. But anyway, so we can guess that that was higher than Korea. So Korea started about 50 years ago at the bottom. But now, if you look at the right-hand column, 2014, Korea's GDP is, is about $30,000. Kenya is still around $1,000. Malaysia, $10,000. And Saudi Arabia is lower than Korea. So we have a couple of implications from this. I may not have enough time to talk about that one. But one thing is, you know, in typical economics developed by Western scholars, we have a theory of competitive advantage. You have to have some competitive advantage. If you have a technology or capital, you have to specialize in, in that kind of resource. You have labor and labor intensive manufacturing. If you have natural resources and something like this. But Korea did not have virtually anything but they made it. And some of the scholars argue because of the labor and education. No, that is not, not the, the fundamental reasons for that one. But anyway, we have some puzzle that is not well explained by existing Western economics. You know, Korea did not have technology. Korea did not have natural resources. Korea did not have anything else. And, and what has made Korea to be successful and like this? So let me uh, move on. And let me show you some of the evaluations by foreign media. And one example is the Economist, the famous uh, the, the Economist. And, and in 2011, some years ago, uh, there's a kind of title, South Korea's Economy. What do you do when you reach the top? Korea is already almost at the level of advanced uh, country. And then they summarized the success was successful achievements of Korea, pretty good. So I re-summarized them along the four dimensions. And number one summary was heroic economic success. In 1960, Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world, but, but 
now at that time, four years ago, five years ago, in 2011, richer than the EU average income in terms of PPP, purchasing power parity. So average income of EU was like a 31, 550, but Korea was a little higher than that one. So on the average, Koreans were richer than average European Union people. That's economic success. Number two, this is pretty interesting. A model for growth of developing countries. Now we heard a lot about China, but China is a little exceptional case for other developing countries like Asian and African and Latin American countries. Can China be a, a role model for those countries? No, China is a little too difficult, you know, too different. It's, 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 this is like a too vast to copy. It's too big. So many people. How many people are there in China? A lot, okay, a lot. A lot. We also have some other examples of successful cases. Singapore and Hong Kong, but these are small city states. Their population is about 3 million or 4 million. You know, about one third of the, the size of uh, Los Angeles. Taiwan has a lot of sovereignty problem, dispute with the main in, uh, China. So we so-called the four little tigers in, in Asia, South Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, Singapore, and still, Korea is, is kind of a good example for, for, for other developing countries. Well, even developed countries such as USA may be able to find some implications from the experience of Korea. What I mean is, no, more, there are a lot more here in the States that Korea would learn, but there are some interesting cases that, that, that the people here in the Silicon Valley and California may learn. I was in, in Japan for one year, about 10 years ago, and I talked with my colleagues at, at, at Tokyo University. And after spending one year of my sabbatical, and, and one of the Tokyo University professors asked me, what, what did you kind of learn, or what did you feel here in, 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 in Japan? I said, there are a lot of things that Koreans should learn from Japan, but there's also something that, that you can learn from Korea, <laughs> so you can learn with each other. So if we have a good understanding of Korean experience, there are a lot of interesting uh, lessons that, that we, can, we can think or we can adapt. Number three is combined growth. This is not what, not what I say, I say but this is what the economist has summarized. The third item is combined growth. Korea's economic growth with democracy. Korea is democratic society. It used to be a dictatorial society about a couple of decades ago, but now all of a sudden Korea became a democratic country. I think the most democratic country in the world is, is Korea. They can say anything but what, what they want. And sometimes it's chaotic, but anyway, it, it, it's, it's democratic. So not just economic growth, but, but also democratic achievement. Well, Koreans are complaining about the income inequality between the rich and the poor. But some statistics show that Korea's income situation is not that bad. Here is a statistic, economic growth with equity. The Gini coefficient lower than Canada in 2010. So income is more f fairly distributed in, in Korea compared to, to Canada. Strange, right? Number four, Korea's potential shown in its history uh, the economist said, Korea developed movable metal type two centuries before Gutenberg. The Gutenberg developed like a metal type, the pressing technique, like a 15th century. But Korean people developed 200 years before that one. But, but this was not correct. In order to be classified as innovation for the movable type, you have to have two conditions. Number one is the type should be made of metal, so it should be durable. And number two is the type should be movable, so you can reuse the, the types. But 200 years before the introduction of the type by Gutenberg, there was an invention like this in Korea, but that was made of metal, but that was not movable. So one condition was violated. In the similar time, there was a similar invention in China, but that was made of wood, even if it was movable. So 
Korean invention and Chinese invention was violating one of these two conditions. So we still give credit to Gutenberg for because Gutenberg met two conditions. So this was a little uh, misunderstanding about the. But I like to appreciate Korean things, but as a scholar, we have to be very fair. Okay, it's not a good appreciation of Korean ingenuity. They are they are pretty much innovative, but not 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 this case. This case is not very good. The second thing pointed out by economists was, in the last imperial dynasty, about 100 years ago, <coughs> benefited from checks and balances more than China, like a 20th, early 20th century or late 19th century. But this was, again, not very much correct. Korea struggled using the checks and balance of, of power strategies, but they failed. The result was Korea was colonized by Japan. Now, China was also struggled, but China was not colonized. Maybe it was too big. So it's good to hear the good kind of potential about Korea, but these were a little misunderstanding. So what I'm saying is foreigners, outsiders, may not have a correct or fair understanding of the success or failure of Korea, and we need a more like a fundamental approaches to a correct understanding of Korean economy and society and the country as a whole. And even some Koreans do not have a fair understanding of Korean potential problems and, and, and success. Let me show you one more uh, statistic, which was recently published. This is a Bloomberg Innovation Index 2016. Just a few weeks ago, it was published. And Bloomberg right, uh, give rankings. No, the, the innovation, which country is more innovative? And which country do you think was ranked number one? The top, South Korea number one, followed by Germany, Sweden, and Japan, and Switzerland, and Singapore, Finland, USA, Denmark, France, fine, except South Korea. So, no, Bloomberg uh, index was pretty much reliable, but, but we don't trust it. No, even South Korea, they, they like it, but they don't, they don't believe it. <laughs> they don't think they're number one in the world in innovation. Still, no, some of the Korean uh, companies and people are copycats, imitating or learning from, from Western, more advanced type of things. So they are struggling, they are doing a pretty good job, but, no, but, but Koreans are not a number one in terms of innovation. So once again, there are some misunderstandings, something that we don't agree with, like that. Uh, so we need a more fundamental uh, kind of approach. So my next thing is the fundamental approach. These are kind of general evaluations about the general Korea's macroeconomic or societal progress. But let me give you some examples about more micro level, like a company level. Let me just take some examples of three uh, Korean uh, big conglomerates. POSCO. POSCO. You've heard about POSCO, right? That's Pohang Steel Company. It's like a steel maker, steel mill one of the best steel makers in the world, the POSCO. So about 50 years ago, the Korea, the late President Park, and he wanted to develop Korean economy. And since Korea was poor and no industrial infrastructure, so he wanted to develop one key industry, and then he chose steel industry. You have to have a st iron and steel industry, then there are a lot of spillover effects on other industrial sectors. So he chose steel industry, but at that time, Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world. So Korea did not have money, so Korea approached World Bank and then begged for some money. Hey, we need, we need some money. And World Bank people say, why do you need money? Because we'd like to kind of, uh, kind of uh, build big steel mill. And the World Bank people kind of denied it. Huh? You are not yet ready for that kind of big business. You have to do some more labor-intensive kind of things. You look at the, the introduction to microeconomics or kind of economics. Now, that's kind of U.S. steel or Nippon steel, but not Korean steel. Now, your pocket bank is less than $100. But Korean people did not give up, so they used the money, actually the compensated money from Japan, the war compensation money, and they put that money into the steel, and then they made a great success. A few years later, Korean people met the economists who refused Korean offer at World Bank 
and then ask, what do you think? Now Korea is a, a big, big success. The result was, at the time, the person, Dr. Zephy, in the general meeting of like a still something like that conference, he said, you know, I'm still oh, not wrong, but Koreans were beyond common sense. Koreans are strange guys. You know, in, in economics, you, you, you can't be successful. You know, like at that low level technology, how can you make that kind of success? But anyway, uh, the existing studies or literature of economics could explain the success story of a post, and that's why they say it's a miracle, because I cannot understand that one. Second example is, is more interesting, that's Samsung Electronics. Samsung used to do business everything, including sugar. So they were sugar maker. The CJ is like a jail jedang, that's the, the literal meaning of Korean is that's like a, a sugar maker, sugar manufacturer. So they made a lot of money from sugar and then textiles and they sold like uh, insurances and put all the money and then they put that money into electronics and they would like to make semiconductors. <clears throat> so people left. But in Japan, there was a Mitsubishi uh, conglomerate. They were a little scared of Korean kind of uprising. So there was a secret study uh, and Mitsubishi Research Institute, and they released like confidential report uh, whether uh, the Samsung's plan to enter the semiconductor industry makes sense or not. The result was not, no way they cannot be successful. Uh, they pointed out five reasons. Number one is Korea's market size was so small. It was almost impossible for them to make semiconductors itself. But even if they could successfully make it, there was no market for their uh, supply. And then related industries were weak. Social over capital was not kind of structured. Company size was so small, they started with like a 39 people like that. Now Samsung Electronics is uh, about 200,000 people. But at the time they started like a 30 something people. And technology was nothing. So, <clears throat> A few Japanese companies have. It's an interesting story is because they probably knew that Samsung was not going to be successful, so they just, they just helped them out. A semiconductor, VLSI, technology from Sharp Corporation, and because of this technology transfer, Samsung could be what it is today. It was kind of an uh, uh, impossible mission. One more, Hyundai Motor Company, U.S. Consumer Report. You can still remember, when, if you are old enough, no, 1980s and 1990s, when, when Hyundai entered the American market, you know, the lowest rankings evaluated by U.S. consumer reports in the early 1980s, and they said, this is the worst car. I would never buy <laughs> this car again. And Frequent decided that a comedy shows this is a junk and this is a toy. You know, 1980s and early 1990s, there were, you know, cars, the the motor vehicles are different from kind of like uh, mobile phones. Cars are related to safety. And I don't want to drive the car which is made in the country that, that I have never heard of. I like to drive a car made in, in, in Germany, made in Japan okay, made in USA okay, but not, not in Yugoslavia, not in, in Korea. At the time there were two cars made in developing countries one is Yugo, made in Yugoslavia, the other is Axel, made in Korea, and then they were struggling, and then Yugo went out of business pretty quickly, but Hyundai survived. <laughs> so this was junk, and this is toy. Now, Hyundai is one of top five automakers in the world, number top five. Now, last year, there was a, like a safety test, and Hyundai uh, Genesis you know, got all the full points. And Mercedes and BMW got like a nine out of 10, like eight out of 10, but Hyundai Genesis got all, all 10 points. This is kind of impossible. How come the country like South Korea could make this kind of reliable car? It's, it's kind of high, high uh, growth rate. So what I'm saying is, you know, all the successful cases, POSCO and, and Samsung and then Hyundai, these are not well explained by the existing wisdom of Western economics. So we need uh, uh, different different kind of things. So what's wrong with the Western economics? 
Let me give you one simple example. This is my good example, the, the iPhone. So if you look at the, 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 the back of this iPhone, it says it's designed by Apple in California, assembled in China. So this fits to our classical economic theory. So designed by Apple in California, assembled in China because design and technology are here in California. China has cheap labor, so let them assemble it. So it's just like a division of labor and competitive advantage. America is superior in technology and design, and China is superior in, in, in labor, labor cost. This is the theory of competitive advantage, but this is too simple. We have to be able to explain why Apple chose China instead of Vietnam, instead of Bangladesh, instead of Sri Lanka. In terms of labor cost, it's lower in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. You know, Chinese labor cost is pretty high. Okay? And you also have to be able to explain why, why Apple, why not Microsoft, why not Nokia, why not Sony, why not Samsung, well, how, how come all, all... So this is to say, the existing theories explain the different competitive advantages when the countries or forms of different endowments. But we have to be able to explain the different competitiveness among the forms and countries which have similar competitive advantages. So it's like a, when you talk about the competitive advantages of South Korea or, or, or like a, the four Asian tigers, we say cheap labor. 1970s and 80s, Korean labor was cheaper, but still higher than the labor in Egypt, Ethiopia, Afghanistan. So when Korean construction companies went to Middle East, the people say because of cheap labor. No, there are a lot of you know, cheaper places. And American multinational firms, European construction firms, hired people from those like Middle East areas. Their labor costs were cheaper, but Koreans were more competitive. So it's not, not just price of labor, but the productivity of labor, which is mostly missing in the existing literature. So let me save time. So let me just go into the, the new framework to explain this kind of things. And this is a new framework. I would say this one. The number one is speed. But this is to say, you know, the labor cost was the same, like a 10 cents per hour. But Koreans were faster. Taiwanese were faster. And now, again, the Apple iPhone, designed by Apple in California, assembled in China. Why Steve Jobs chose China? Because it's faster. You know, when Apple introduced a new model like iPhone 5, you have to be able to manufacture like a 100 million units in in two months. And only, only China can do that. So it's not the labor cost, but it's kind of economies of scale, you know, agility, you know, fast speed, and something else which is not well treated in typical theories of, of international economics. And also precision. You know, you still remember you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if it is made in, nowadays made in China is fine. Nowadays, made in Korea is fine, but 30 years ago, nobody bought made in Korea, <laughs> made in Taiwan. But anyway, 10 years ago, made in China, and, and people may not like made in China. However, Steve Jobs solved this problem because it's designed. The details are all designed by Apple in California, so don't worry about the design and, and accuracy or precision of the things. It's just assembled in China, but all the other things are designed and, and, and precisely designed. So you can solve the problem of a precision. So it's not, again, the labor costs, but speed and precision. And something like this is missing in, in classical uh, wisdom of economics. I would like to call it agility. The second category is learning. And Koreans are good at, at learning. But you have to be very careful about the vocabulary. If you say it copycatting, imitation, that doesn't sound good. But if you call it learning capability, good guy, good student, it sounds great. So the perception you know, mainly depends on what kind of vocabulary words you're using. 
So it's, it's not just imitation, but, but learning, you know, learning capabilities. I have taught at Stanford for the last one year, and the Stanford people would like to be more innovative. They would like to think out of box, blue ocean strategies and something innovative. But that, that's good. But you have to learn first. You have to learn from good professors first. So learning and then innovativeness. From the beginning, if you are trying to be innovative, that's good. But there will be a lot of mistakes, a lot of trial and, and errors. So I'm not saying you shouldn't be innovative. You have to be innovative. But the fast route, the shortcut to innovation is to learn from good teachers and good professors and, and good uh, colleagues. But if you just learn, you may have wrong target. You have to have like a good target, like the best practices. So let me get back to my example of iPhone again. Now let's say, so what is the competitive advantage of Steve Jobs? People easily say he's a genius in, in computer. He's a genius scientist. But as you know, no, Steve Jobs you know, never took any engineering courses. He just dropped out when he was a freshman. You know. He just took some like, liberal art courses, and, and he, he never took any, any scientific engineering courses. He was not a scientist. He was not an engineer. Now, what is the competitive advantage of iPhone? There is a phone, but do you think Steve Jobs invented phone? No, it was already there. There is camera. You think Steve Jobs invented camera? No, there was camera already iPhone, nothing he invented. Well, no, we still appreciate it. Steve Jobs is one of the most, that's, there's no doubt about that. But what are the scientific contributions? Scientific kind of uh, uh, ingenuity? Nothing in, in, to some extent. Second point, the camera function. He put camera here. Which company do you think has more fundamental, more important scientific kind of technologies about camera technology. Is it Sony or Nikon, the professional kind of manufacturer of, of camera, or, or, or Apple? Sony, sorry, what is that? Canon, right? Canon or Nikon, right? the, the, the camera manufacturers, they may have more, better technologies. But I would guess they may be in big trouble in the next five years if something would not happen. Because people would buy this one, this is good enough. The cameras for the, the normal people. Professional photographers may be different. But you know, 90% of the time, this is, is fine. This is to say, the success factor is not the highest technology. It's not the most sophisticated technology. It's not the state-of-the-art technology. But that is the combination of good technologies, commercially making sense, sense technology. It's not just scientifically highest level. This is the next, le next one. It's mixing best practices and, and synergy creation. The synergy creation. Another thing is, you know, there's a, there are a lot of interesting stories about, about Steve Jobs. And he was interviewed by BBC some time ago. And then the BBC anchor asked him, you know, do you also do marketing survey before you launch your product? And Steve Jobs said, no, I, I, I don't do that. And uh, why don't you do that? He said, because they don't know what they want until I introduce a new product. Sounds like creative. But the really important point of Steve Jobs is he was sure that people would buy this. Why? Because he included all the things that the current consumers need, and then he added something. Now let's say, there, there was a phone, there was a big breakthrough of the phone, so people created facsimile machine. It's great, it was great. But this is different from phone. So scientifically speaking, you know, facsimile is good, good, good product, good, good invention. But we don't know how, 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 how much we, we like it. But smartphone is a phone plus alpha. Facsimile is not phone. Phone is A, facsimile is B. Smartphone is, is phone is A, and smartphone is A, A plus, A double plus, A, A triple plus. So people would buy it. So this is to say, not disruptive innovation. It sounds great, but commercially successful product is not disruptive innovation. It's more commercially, incremental innovation. So you have to have some, some, 
you have to benchmark the best practice first and mix with others, and then you have to have synergy creation among these things. So the real important point or a competitive advantage of iPhone is synergy creation of good devices. And the last one is you have to work hard, diligent, and then you have to strong uh, uh, goal orientation. And now the, one of the things that I can say, which is related to this, is, is Japan. We, we talked about Japanese last decade. Japan has not improved for the last 10 years, or we say two decades and 20 years. It's because Japan, Japanese people relatively have lost momentum for further growth. Japanese people used to be a very goal-oriented people. In Japanese, they say Yamado Damashi. It's like Japanese Yoshi type of things. We can do that, something like this. But now the youngsters in Japan have lost that kind of momentum. They are very much complacent with the current success. It's pretty much comfortable in, in Japan. They are not uh, motivated anymore. So there's a statistic that like uh, 3 million or 4 million Japanese youngsters are dependent on their parents. They don't want to get a job. They don't want to get married. They don't want to talk. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there are some statistics like that. one. So this may be maybe the main reason, not macroeconomic policies. So whatever the policies of macroeconomic monetary or fiscal policies, those may not work if the fundamental reason is, is with like a lack of dedication and lack of goal orientation. So we may have to go over some of the, uh, these variables which are not well uh, treated in, in existing studies. So there are four uh, main factors, and there are two sub-factors for each of these main factors. So eight sub-factors. And if you just take the initials, then A, B, C, D. And this is my, my A, B, C, D framework. It sounds like very simple, but it has a pretty strong <laughs> theoretical background. I'm not going to talk too much about the theories, but let me just go over the theoretical relationship uh, of this ABCD model. And this is my next slide. I'm going to be quick. I'm not going to be very much sophisticated economic jargons. You know, here we have ABCDs, and here we have established theories and emerging theories and some case studies. The established theories, and we have a very nice theory in economics and business that is early entry advantage, more professionally speaking, first mover advantage. We like it. We means Americans. When I teach in Korea, we, we means Koreans, but here in the States, it's, we Amer Americans, Californians, the people at the Silicon Valley, like, you know, for, you, have, you have to enter first. First mover advantage. Now, I'm talking about speed, and there are two types of speed. Number one is early entry and then fast catch up. Like entry speed and process speed. But existing theories are talking about just entry speed. The fast first move advantage. But you know, the fast process advantage or fast catch up, this is, this is what Samsung and Hyundai just caught up. I once uh, visited uh, the Hyundai Motors, the Namyang R&D centers, and they, their r and what they do is, was they just put up all the best cars in the world, Mercedes here, and, and BMWs, and Jaguar, and, and Lexus, like that one. And then they disassembled one by one, compared each part with that of Hyundai. If there's anything wrong or weak in Hyundai component, that they just order to fix it. So this makes it, you know, so fast catch up. But anyway, Theoretically, academically speaking, not just the entry speed, but the process speed. So we have to study more about economics of speed. Precision, American wisdom is automation. Don't trust people, we trust machines. It's a more capital-intensive equipment kind of things rather than uh, labor-intensive. That's, that's to enhance uh, the precision. But in Asia, Japan, and Korea, it's not, not just automation, but just-in-time method total quality management, and Six Sigma kind of things, these may increase uh, the precision level of management. These are techniques, but they are not yet developed as theories and in models, so we can, we can work on them. 
the learning in, in strategic management of business, there is a very nice theory, which is currently the most popular theory. That is the resource-based view of the firm, RVB. You know, this is, you know, this says, you know, in order to be successful, you have to be unique in terms of like some resources which are not easily copied by your competitors, which are rare, okay, and and valuable and not no substitutes like this. So you have to have a unique resource. But this is this sounds good, but how many firms and countries have unique resources in the world? Some, but they are gonna be soon disappeared. So really sustainable competitive advantage is not just the possession of unique resource per se, but the capability of learning. Now, what is the capability of a student and a professor? The amount of knowledge? No. The capability of, of accumulating knowledge, deep understanding capability. We, we call it absorptive capacities. There is a vocabulary like this, but it's not yet theorized. So we need to work on theorizing this kind of very important kind of thing. And the best practices. And again, the Western perspective is like a disruptive innovation. I, I like this word, but how many people in the whole world can have disruptive innovations? The really important issue in, in business is sort of incremental innovation. Japanese were pioneers in doing this. So they, they say kaizen, that's like incremental innovation. There are two different words. Kai gakko, that's like a disruptive innovation. And gaizen in Japanese is like incremental innovation. Creative imitation. So these are the very important concepts and that have to, they have to be uh, theorized. The convergence, the Western economics, you know, traditionally we didn't like it. We, we didn't like converge, we didn't like mixing. We like specialization. And you know, we have a, like a typical microeconomics, we have to have like a minimum point of average cost function. You have to specialize to guarantee the minimum level of average cost. So you have to like increase the, the, like, uh, the, the volumes, specializing in one thing. That is uh, economics of scale. But sometimes, yes, economics of scope, a little diversification, but that has to be related diversification. So we have two concepts in economics. One is economics of scale, there's economics of scope. But the success factors of Japanese firms and Korean firms and some Asian tiger firms, you no, know, it's like economies of diversity, combinative uh, uh, capability, like a travel and a smartphone. So the, the capability of travel, for example, was understated. And people have mostly negative perspective of travel. Travel is kind of octopus leg type of diversification no relationship, they were just favored by the government and they were just like a killing small and medium sized firms. These are bad guys, so the feature of the Korean economy is not. This is typical misunderstanding. Now, Chebol, there are two kinds of Chebol, Chebols, Korean Chebol. You know Chebol, right? Korean big conglomerate. So Hyundai and Samsung are Chebols, big conglomerate. There are two types of Chebol. Number one is successful Chebol. So Chebol who is, who is succeeding. Number two is who failed. So Chebol itself is a neutral term, but Chebol can succeed or fail. When they succeed, when they have a good combination of their businesses. But if some other Chebol just copied, some successful Chebol, they, they fail. So you cannot criticize Chebol itself, but you cannot criticize unrelated diversification. Wrong mix of, of business portfolio. Chebol itself is a is, is big, big conglomerate. So we have to think about like economics of diversity. You know, how much diversity or what is the optimum diversity? But one thing is missing in Western economics is, okay, diversity is fine, so we have a concept like economics of scope. Not just economics of scale, but different parts of economics of scope, that is fine. By definition, economics of scope is to diversify into related sectors. But some of the Korean travels were diversified into unrelated sectors. Like Samsung earned money from selling sugar. They earned money from selling textiles. And then put them together, those are cash cows, and put them together and, and into, into semiconductors made a great success. So sugar and semiconductors, are they related or not? The economics professor, don't do that. This is stupid. This is a waste, you know, waste of resources. So now there's a management technique management had instinct. 
So there should be management, not, not just economics. We need, we need to know both, economics and management. So I will, I will come back to this point. But anyway, well, there are some kind of important concepts and kind of uh, theorists which need to be more theorized and developed further. The last one, dedication, inspiration, American wisdom, inspiration. There was a very famous article by Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, 1994, published in Foreign Affairs, and he compared Asian tigers and like a Western farms, and he said, you know, Asian countries have been doing pretty good job, but, but mostly out of perspiration. They worked harder, like uh, 15 hours a day. They mobilized all the resources in a short period of time. But you know, there is a decrease in returns to scale. Because you can, you can work like 15 hours, but you cannot work 25 hours a day. And there's a limited like, resource mobilization kind of things. But like Westerners got economic success because of inspiration kind of things. So they are more inspirational. However, in the early stage of economic development, everybody should work harder. 200 years ago, when Americans settled down here, and the success factor for Americans was they worked harder than Europeans. You think Americans were smarter than Europeans? No, they are all homo sapiens, all the same. But Americans, the, the, the settlers, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, they worked harder than those in Europe. And then inspiration. So everybody should do perspiration first and then inspiration. There's, there's no clear dichotomy between inspiration people and perspiration people. People start with perspiration, and then they combine that with, with inspiration. So it, it's an economic stage model, rather than uh, kind of uh, basic kind of dichotomy of these two things. So inspiration, but perspiration. So we'd like to, this is kind of interesting concept, isn't it? We have to develop an economy of hardworking, hardworking student. As professors, which kind of student do you like? Smart guy or a good guy or diligent guy? I like, I like, I like hardworking guy. And again, American strategic management, we emphasize unique positioning. You have to have like a, find like a niche market and find a unique positioning like this. And then uh, they like uh, highlight some, some subjective examples and the cases and fascinating, but it's not easy to generalize. Koreans, the Samsung and Hyundai, they do like this, continued growth after catch up. So they catch up with one target and then they are not complacent. And they create new crisis artificially. That's what I said, constructed crisis, I, I, I termed this. And an extra commitment. So every time like Samsung and Hyundai achieve something and the CEO like, uh, Revitalize. Hey, this, there's a long way for us to go. It's, it's, it, the crisis is not yet over. <laughs> so they're living in the environment of the crisis. But things like this. this and once again, the, the, if I explain the last decade of, of Japan, that might be a loss of some motivation or constructed crisis like this. So the left-hand column is existing theory. We already know, know this. The right-hand column, there are some concepts and theories have been there, but we need to work more on that one. So if we have these two sets of policies and strategic management and theories, and we, we're going to be better off. So the real skill is to, to understand both. One is like conventional warfare, and the other is like a nuclear warfare kind of things. So well, let me just be brief. I'm going to give a simple case or example for each of these four cases. Number one, agility. So speed and precision. This is like a Ford Model T, the competitive edge of Model T was speed, okay, it's conveyor belt system, production system. So he could reduce the cost significantly. And then Toyota added quality dimension to this American uh, manufacturing system. So Toyotaism is characterized by quality and cost. To simplify uh, my, my argument, a Hyundai uh, competitive advantage, they, they copied everything. <laughs> they added speed again to Toyotaism. So if you look at this one, speed, quality, and cost, and higher production speed, tighter control on quality through on-site, 
and 24 monitoring system, and growing confidence in quality in US 10 years and 100,000 years in warranty. Well, actually, Hyundai caught up with Toyota for, for quality about 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But American consumers did not trust Hyundai. Hey, where, where, what the heck is this? Is Korea? Who cares for Korea? So Hyundai got mad because they thought that their quality was as good as Toyota, but people did not trust it. So they did marketing strategy. Okay, okay, now 10 year warranty and 100,000 year warranty. At that time, even Mercedes just offered like a five year and then and, and 50,000. That was the maximum. They just doubled it. And then American consumers began to trust Hyundai qualities. But still, Hyundai technology was not as good as Toyota. We, we knew that. But they made it faster. All the processes faster. 24-hour controlling system, 24-hour like a service system. If you go to Toyota dealer, it, it, it takes like three days. And, and Hyundai dealer, one day, something like this. So it's not just high technologies. A typical economists or business people say, high, 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 then. Even today, Toyota technology is higher than the Hyundai. Even today, Sony technology is higher than the Samsung. But Samsung is making a lot more money than Sony. I'm not saying technology is not important, but there are many other business-related variables, strategic variables. The second example is the benchmarking. So US still, US learned from Europe and then became the dominant. Nippon still, and they, they learned from USA and they became number one. Korean still, and, and they learned everything from, from everybody and they became number one. So if I simplify, the model is Japan was the best student of the West. So Japan uh, had one teacher, so they could reduce the amount of trial and errors, and they could save time. Korea, the best student of Japan and, and the West. Korea has had two, two teachers, two good teachers. So my point is imitate, improve, and innovate. Our goal is to be an innovator, no, no doubt. I'm going to be an innovator, but the process should be learning. That is the shortcut to be an innovator. The, from the beginning, if you, don't, if, just, if you don't take classes <laughs> in good schools like this, if you just think just by yourself, it's going to take forever. Well, some people, one out of 1,000, one out of 1 million people may be successful, but not, not all the time. So our, our dependent variable is innovation, but independent variable should be learning. So learning capabilities, benchmarking strategies should be the first. Imitate and improve and innovate. I have done a research on Silicon Valley for the last uh, one year, and, and there are several advantages of Silicon Valley. But one of the advantages was like a big circulation of the good technologies and, and, and talents like this. It's not technology per se, but environment to boost that kind of technology. Learning with each other, like cross benchmarking and combining these kind of things. So imitate, improve, and innovate. The last one is the mixing and synergy. GE is pretty much a diversified form, but if you compare that with other Japanese type and Korean type, still a very narrow, narrow diversification. And Sony is pretty much broad diversification, but Samsung is, I, I, I termed it dominant diversification. There is a one dominant sector, that's Samsung Electronics, which covers about 50% of our total income, and all the other sectors are not independent. They are seemingly independent, but they are actually supporting the dominant sector. So this is really the higher dimension of, of related and supporting sectors. But GE is, as long as you have some kind of profitable sector, you can diversify into that sector, but Korea is a different way. It has to be supportive to the main dominant diversification. So different style. So, so to, to maximize the synergies of their business portfolio. The last one is dedication. You know, as I briefly mentioned, the Americans, the settlers 200 years ago, Protestant spirit. What is the Protestant spirit? Work hard. Be healthy. So Americans work hard. Japanese samurai spirit is Japanese work harder than Americans. And the Koreans work the hardest. Okay. They work like a, they work crazy. <laughs> they invest crazy <laughs> like this. So this is, uh, I would say, same uh, same our spirit. But let me just skip it. But anyway, you know, the dedication and diligence and goal orientation is 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 very much important.
So once again, I'm not saying technology is not important, but beyond the technology, there are many other managerial variables that we can, we can, we can consider to enhance your commercial competitiveness. And now, let me be brief on Steve Jobs of Apple. So I developed the ABCD model to explain the fundamental reasons for the success of the Korean economy. But during, you know, while I was writing the book, I found that this may be applied to the success of, of other companies and other firms. So I applied that to Steve Jobs and then it, it, it wonderfully worked. So Steve Jobs, even Silicon Valley. So let me generalize the ABCD model to other cases, the American case, Steve Jobs, agility. Now, as I said, you know, designed by Apple in California and assembled in China, his main reason is to, to speed up the production. If they introduce like iPhone 6 or 7, and again, you know, 100 million units should be manufactured in, in two months, and only China can do that. So even if the labor cost is twice or three times as, as high as that of Vietnam and Singapore and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, but they have to do that in, in China. Otherwise, they cannot meet the speed. I don't want to wait like a, a three months or four months and six months. The benchmarking, you know, he said, look at this, we do not grow most of the food we eat. We wear clothes other people make. We speak a language that other people developed. You don't have to be creative in everything. You have to be creative only, only on few things and, and just borrow something and all the others from, from others. Major innovation ultimately comes from good, good benchmarking. So he actually understands all the related sectors of his business. He studied a lot. So he knows what kind of products are going to be successful in, in the next generation. The convergence. If you look at the history of, of uh, Apple, Steve Jobs was failed in stage one. Even if he introduced like a tremendous, you know, you know kind of like an awesome product like Macintosh and iMac, he failed. Even if he was superior in technology, but commercially not, not good, PC won. He began to succeed when he introduced iPod and iPhone. And now the difference is this. You know, this used to be kind of the story before iPhone, computer and all these kind of things, and, and Steve just put all these things into one device, and that is iPhone. Simple, mixing strategy. Everything is here. Scientifically, not, the scientists may not appreciate Steve Jobs, but we appreciate Steve Jobs. So we have to distinguish scientific contribution and commercial contribution. The last one, dedication, the famous words, stay hungry and stay foolish. Stay hungry and stay foolish. The only way to the great work is to love what you do like this. This is a highly motivated person and a highly uh, dedicated person. So ABCDs really work for uh, Steve Jobs. Final thing, Silicon Valley also is related to kind of uh, the ABCD framework. Now, I've studied uh, Silicon Valley for, for a while. There are six major innovation centers here in the States. Two in the East, New York City, Boston area, and two in California. One is Silicon Valley and the other is this area, Southern California. And then one is Seattle area and the other is Texas Austin. There are six innovation centers here in the States. And then there's a very interesting research published uh, just a year ago Silicon Valley Competitiveness and Innovation Report, 2015. And one of the interesting results or statistics was that Silicon Valley was, did not you know, invest a kind of R&D expenditures. R&D expenditures grow the most slowly among the innovation uh, regions in, in here. But it, it's, it's the most productive area, Silicon Valley. So this is, say, you know, the, this is not technology per se, but, but something else. Let me show you one more statistics. This is the statistics uh, survey result by uh, PwC, Price Waters and Coopers. And they did a survey to the CEOs, which company do you think is the most innovative company in the world? And number one was chosen 
like the Apple. Yeah, Apple was number one. And number two was Google and Amazon and then Samsung and then Tesla. Like that. This is the result of the survey to the American CEOs. And then PwC compared their actual R&D spending. And then Apple spent just $4.5 billion. And the ranking was 32. But, but perception was number one. Actual investing was, was 32. Samsung was $13.4 billion. So they spent three times as much as, as that of Apple. And the ranking was on number two. Do you, do you know which company was number one in actual spending in R&D? VW, Volkswagen. So once again, it's very dangerous to say that no, the technology is not important. It is important, but there's no high correlation between these two things. Over a long period of time, it may be helpful, but there's a lot of hidden costs for, for, for things like this. So we may need to find some other things. Once again, technology is one dimension. We have to still think about technological breakthrough, technological leadership, that is fine, but not just 100% on, on technology. We need some like, like a managerial kind of things. So this is my uh, last slide. Uh, Silicon Valley competitiveness is, number one is that is dynamics. Fast processes of idea generation and commercialization, entrepreneurship and business innovation, this is the, the most efficient area in the world. Like in other areas, if you would like to establish a, a, a company, it's gonna take like uh, two months. In Silicon Valley, maybe two weeks like this. It's like a fast rotation of ideas, generations. It's market economy, however, not everybody is going to be successful in Silicon Valley. Some statistics show that annually 3,000 opened or moved into Silicon Valley area, and 2,500 closed or moved out. This is to say new companies, 3,000, 2,500 failed, more than 80% failed. The success rate is less than 20%. This is a market. There's a market, there's a big empire evaluation by the market. You have to beat the market. Not everybody's successful. It's not like a gold rush. It's, the market is, is, is very severe. You have to survive in the market. But still, 500 net gain, so Silicon Valley is growing. And number two is interaction. Continuous churning of companies and jobs and learning and benchmarking other skills. They are laid off. They are not worried. Some, they are hired in, by other people. There is a natural, direct, indirect you know, technology transfer and manual transfer. They learn with each other. And sharing experiences of foreign expertise, and, and many people are from foreign, like Indians and Chinese and Koreans. Interaction, cross benchmarking. The third one is ecosystem, industry ecosystem, computers, and people say Silicon Valley is a mecca for software. No, not just computer industry, not just software, also hardware, also biology, like a medicine and, and space technology, everything is there. There is a mixture like a synergistic mixture of, of different kind of things. And not just technologies, but, but finance and legal services are, are pretty good. And also living in environment ecosystem, there's a Stanford and a Berkeley, you know, you know the San Francisco and the medical, so a lot like this. And culture and leisure and climate and everything is good. So this is it's like an industry ecosystem and also living ecosystem. And the reason why I just talked with uh, Professor Peck before this presentation, and this area is good for film industry and leisure industry and entertainment industries. And this is good for kind of, you know, we need some, some background and good schools you know, and like this. This is to say, if your core competence is technology per se, it's gonna be easily copied. But if your core competence is environmental factors like this, it's not easy to copy it. Koreans cannot copy Silicon Valley. Koreans can copy iPhone. They already know everything about iPhone, but Koreans cannot copy Silicon Valley. Koreans cannot copy, you know, Kind of this kind of Southern California. So it's gonna be some good news and then bad news. The last one is motivation and willingness to work harder and wider income disparity. There is another statistic that in Silicon Valley, the income is, is widely, you know, income disparity is not fair. This is to say, now I can make it. You know, if the incomes are, are all the same, like communist countries, you are not motivated. <laughs> and also, Highest income, uh, improving uh, economic status from bottom five to the no, bottom 20th 20 percentile to the probability of moving from bottom fifth to the top fifth is uh, one out of eight, 12.5 percent. The mo mobility is the highest among, among American uh, kind of uh, cities. So these dynamics are 
the real core competences of Silicon Valley rather than collection uh, of technologies. Dynamics, this is related to agility. Interaction is of cross benchmarking. Ecosystem is convergence. And motivation is kind of dedication. Conclusion. So ABCD framework is not exclusive for Korea and again can be applied to, to other countries. So we may think about some others and we can think about uh, what's wrong with, uh, with our situations. Now I have experience at the Stanford and some others. And Americans are pretty good, number one in the world, but sometimes speed is a little bit, sometimes a little slow, sometimes companies is a little slow. So if you just come up with those kind of things, you can sustain your competitive advantage. Again, existing studies just argue that you have to continuously develop new technology. That's one dimension. The other managerial dimension is we have to be concerned about speed and benchmarking starting and like this. The photo studies suggest Korea for photo development. So Koreans have been pretty good along these dimensions, but not perfect. Speed is still not 100% not perfect. Precision is still weak. Benchmarking is sometimes not very good. So I would say Korea is not grade A for all these variables and they have to uh, do some, some other diagnosis and they have to get some, some prescriptions. And to help other countries for efficient and sustainable development, Korea is the only country which was a recipient of international aid and now donor of international aid. Uh, aid. So Korean government is, is, has a budget, huge budget of helping other countries, but they don't know how to help. So rather than just give money, but if we develop this kind of like uh, uh, the, the management models or kind of models together with the money, and that will be more helpful to other uh, countries. Korea was, uh, again, one of the poorest countries in the world right after the Korean War. So Korean people appreciate the international help. So it's time for Koreans to give back their help, not just with money, but this kind of kind of things. And this may be applied to some other areas, industry level and farm level and country level and some other areas. Thank you very much.